The broadcast is now starting. All Good afternoon, all everyone, -only mode. and welcome to today's webinar, Navigating Adult Systems, Medicaid Waivers, Question and Answers, sponsored by Peak Parent Center's RSA Shift Project. My name is Beth Schaffner, and before our speaker begins today, we have several announcements to make. Uh, first of all, PEAK and the RSA SHIFT Project are committed to providing youth with disabilities and their families information and resources for learning about important transition tools and strategies and receiving support for navigating transition-related and adult-focused service systems. We are pleased to announce that the RSA SHIFT Project has received a one-year extension for its services from the Rehabilitation Services Administration to continue through September of 2020. Please watch for information about new project products and training opportunities that will be coming up during this year. Now I have a few items for you about participating in today's webinar. If you are connected to the webinar through the internet, you should see your attendee control panel in the upper right hand corner of your own computer's desktop. By default, you are listening in using your computer's speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone on the control in the audio section of the control panel, and then dial in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions panel on the control panel. You can send your questions in at any time during the presentation, since our focus is on questions and answers today. We will be monitoring the question box and we'll address questions as we go. Our speakers hand out with some PowerPoint informational slides is available for you to download. Also on the control panel, uh, in the handout section. So uh, please feel free to use that. After, as you leave the webinar today, you're going to receive an evaluation survey about the presentation. We would appreciate if you would take just a minute to complete that and provide us with your feed up. Feedback. You will receive a follow-up email very soon after the webinar with a link also to the recording of today's webinar. So without going any further, um, I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Adam Tucker, who's with the Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Finance. And Adam, maybe when you get started, you can just tell us just a little more about your job sure. there. And Let's go ahead and turn it over. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Beth. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I work for, my name is Adam Tucker. I work for the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing, and I am a home and community-based benefits uh, specialist. And then I'm also the subject matter expert for supported employment at, uh, at, H at HICPUF is what we call it. So, um, with that, I did bring some slides today, however, and the, the questions that were submitted prior to this webinar have kind of embedded in, into, the, into the slides themselves. Um, however, you know, if there's other questions that you guys have, I'd much rather just do a question and answer um, and have you guys just take the, the, the PowerPoint with you um, as kind of backup. But until we kind of get some more questions and stuff uh, coming through, I will start with the webinar. And if you guys get bored with that, that just means you have to ask questions so that we can dig into that stuff. So anyway, um, so let me see if I can figure out how to change the slides. There we go. I figured it out. All right. So first thing we always have to do is our mission. Um, the mission of, of healthcare policy and financing is to improve healthcare access 
um, and outcomes for people with, with, that we serve while demonstrating sound stewardship of financial resources. And what we, what we mean by sound stewardship of financial resources does not mean the cheapest, it means the most quality. Um, and so that's something just to remember. We're, we're not saying in there that we have to go and pick the cheaper thing. We, just, we need to make sure that we're um, at the same time protecting the money is also means that people are getting the services and supports that they, that they need. Um, so I really wanted to start with some just basic Medicaid overview uh, because there really are two different pieces. And for anybody who with, with uh, severe disabilities or with a disability that needs what we call home and community-based services, there really is two parts of Medicaid. Um, and the first one is that mandatory state plan benefit. So that's your doctor that's going to the hospital, um, that's getting x-rays, pharmacy, uh, mental health services, all of those kinds of things are part of, are part of what we call mandatory state plan benefits. Or another term you might hear is called straight Medicaid. What that means, <coughs> excuse me, what that means is that that one, this one is based on financial eligibility. So this is what you can sign up for through PEAK um, and the PEAK website because it's just purely based on financial resources and it's not based on, on anything else. And just straight Medicaid, again, that's where you get hospitals, doctors, dentists, all of those kinds of things. The other piece of this, which I think most people on this webinar are more interested in, are, the, are what we call optional benefits. And under that optional benefits, that's where you find home and community-based services or the waivers. So the, the Supported Living Services Waiver or SLS Waiver um, or the DD Waiver or the Developmental Disability Waiver. All of those are, are, you have to be eligible for Medicaid. And then these are a set of services that lie on top of that eligibility for Medicaid. So what that means is, is that there's different finance or different, different eligibility requirements to, to be able to access those, uh, those supports and services. That also means that there's, that you can't really do that through a website, that there are, that people need to see doctors, um, doctors' diagnoses. It means that there needs to be a functional level of care. Um, all of those kinds of pieces that actually have to be done through assessment and working through a case manager. So that's actually one of the reasons why you can't hop on our on the Peak website and sign up for a waiver uh, because you really actually to get onto a waiver you have to go through this extra set of eligibility criteria. Um, another really important thing to know about human home and community-based services is that uh, it is what we call a level a level of care. So a person who qualifies for home and community-based service must must basically demonstrate that if they do not get these services, they will end up in an institution or a nursing home. That's the level of care that we that that the federal government says that waivers can work with under. So that's another really important kind of thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, and before I kind of move on from that, there are a couple of things that as you guys are working with family members or you yourself, where you're kind of transitioning between the education system into the adult world, there's some things to kind of think about when you're thinking about home and community-based services. One, they're much more flexible than you, than you normally see in the education system. Um, and with that flexibility um, also increases the scope. So if you think about with education and special education, uh, those services are really designed to support somebody while they're in school or they're school aged, whereas home and community-based services are really designed to support somebody from every angle and every facet of life. So that can mean everything from helping get a shower at home to support going into the community, um, all of those different types of things. So just remember that, that with that flexibility and kind of that larger scope there, it becomes more complicated. And it's just about making sure that you're working through that system and working with a case manager. And then some of the things that we highly recommend is, is that you guys get a notebook or one single place where you can write down all information. So if you go to a meeting and there's information that was given to you, if you make a phone call, if you do any of those kinds of things, that you're documenting it in one place so that you put the, the, the day and the time there, 
you write out what was what was said or decided and you also take you also try to ask for people's names because you may call uh, at, at one o'clock and then you need to call back at three and you might talk to a different person. So it's also important that you're just documenting that, having it in one place so that you can take it with you everywhere. The other thing that we highly recommend is that you also have some place to, to keep all documents that you collect together. So if that's a safe box, if that's just a cardboard box, if that's a, a plastic bag, that all of that works. Just making sure that you're collecting that and keeping it all in one place so that if something comes up, you have the ability to go and find it quickly or you at least know where things are. Um, and then also remember that because the scope is so much bigger, because things get more complicated, it's also about working over time in building the services that you need. So it's really important that, that you know what you want and that you continue to ask for what you want. Um, you may not get it the first time, you may not get it the second time, but over time you can build these services to truly support the things that, that, that your loved one needs. Um, and so just to be thinking, kind of thinking through those different types of things. And it may, and it's also not a bad idea because you're going to, because your loved one is going to be asked for their story a number of times. Um, and we apologize for that. I know how kind of painful that gets after a while, but it's important to know that and to write that, write that down, take the time to actually craft what the individual story is, what those needs are, all of those kinds of things, because that will, that will just help with advocacy. You will also encounter people where you can just hand them a copy of the story and that works for them. Um, and so that can also cut down on time. And it also makes it make sure that that when you're walking into team meetings or service planning meetings, that you're making sure you, you know um, what you want and what, what you need to ask for. So with that, <coughs> as we kind of discussed a little bit earlier, financial eligibility um, is what you can do through the PEAK website, and that's straight Medicaid. Then there's this next piece, which is the level of care. That's where you hear the dreaded term, the CIS, um, also the ULTC 100.2, um, along with the DD determination. Those are the three kind of magic pieces of paper that bring everything together that allows, that allows us to, to say that the waiver, that this will work for this individual and we enroll that person into that waiver. Just so you, that you guys know, if you guys walk into a CCB today um, and talk to a case manager, you really are looking at six to nine months from the start of, of, a, of the uh, process to actually getting the service plan in place. It does take time for that to happen. We do have um, a new program called State SLS, the State SLS program, and there are actually services and supports in that program that the CCBs administer. So they're the ones who control the budgets around that. They're the ones who can do placement. They're the ones who can do all of that. That state SLS program can support people while they're going through that, that enrollment process. So that can, that can include things like respite, personal care, um, even things like supported community connections or supported employment. All of that stuff is in the state SLS program. And you just have to ask and work with your CCB to see if they actually have the funding to support you. Currently, there is not a wait list. So, <clears throat> so that, that is a, a, val a, a valid option for most people around the state. You probably won't get the full range of services that you'll get once you fully enroll into the waiver. But at least that will be a stopgap to try to support families and individuals as they're really transitioning out of school and kind of into the adult world. So just so you guys know, we do have quite a few different waivers, but for, for today, we're gonna really focus in more on the two IDD adult waivers, which is that supported living services waiver and the DD waiver. But the other ones that are there, if somebody does need something like residential supports and they're waiting to be enrolled in the developmental disability waiver, there are other waivers that individual would be eligible for. So like the elderly, blind, and disabled waiver. That waiver does not have a wait list like the DD waiver. So there is a way to, if you need something like residential supports, there is a way to enroll into another waiver, utilize that until the DD waiver becomes available. 
all of this goes through case management. So case management, you guys should, and I always say this, if you guys are really looking at, okay, I don't have, I don't have 80 hours a week to figure out how Medicaid works, which um, I only have like 60 and I barely know how Medicaid works. Um, the, the biggest person that you can, or the biggest role that you can really kind of learn or understand what, they're, what they do is case manager. So the case manager helps with the service planning. The case manager authorizes services and the case manager also monitors those services. So the case manager has an important role. And if you have the time and you want to understand how some of this stuff works, case management is a really good place to start. That's how I started in this field. I was a case manager down in New Mexico um, and worked on the, on the Navajo and Zuni reservations, uh, specifically with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And case management is really important because they're the ones who are kind of that, that system thread, right? So you as the family member and the individual and in services, you're the foundation. And then you have service providers and services that kind of layer on top of that. And what the case manager is, is they're the ones who kind of tie all of that together. They kind of are able to pull all of that together. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that case managers are, are perfect. Uh, nothing in our system is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, um, but they really are. They do have a desire to try to support people. You're also going to see a high turnover for case managers. Case management is considered an entry level job. And so you're going to have quite a few case managers over time. That, again, is why it's so important to keep logs and notes about what's going on so that when you do get a new case manager, you can kind of let them know this is this is what's been happening. They'll go back and look at log notes. They'll do all of that, all their due diligence from their side. But really being able to see, um, you know, a parent's notes from a meeting that happened two months before they started is really going to be really beneficial for them as they're working with you and the individual and services to to kind of meld and shape uh, the services that the person needs to be successful and independent in the community. Adam, yes. Um, we just could you give us a clarification on? You had mentioned the Peak website earlier, yes. and I know there were some questions that we received about that. Can you just make sure folks know that Peak Parent Center and is Peak not the Peak? Is not, yes, related. I was actually say I was actually saying that, and I'm like going, I bet people are going to be confused about that. Yeah. So, so Peak is the website. So Peak is a statewide website that is owned and controlled by the state government. It is where you go to sign up for everything from Medicaid to SNAP benefits or, or food stamps. Um, there's a lot of different things that just by logging on and putting your information in there, it will figure out financially what you're eligible for. Um, again, it's based on financial stuff. It's not based on, on uh, any other kind of criteria like disability or anything like that. It's purely based on financial. Um, that website, literally the way that I've always found is I like Google Peak Colorado, um, and, and it's an acronym, and I don't know what the acronym stands for, so if you want to keep them all capitalized when you spell out Peak, then, you, then you'll probably find it a little bit quicker. I will warn you that- Or you'll find Peak Parent Center. <laughs> or you'll find Peak Parent Center, which is, which is also a great thing. So, um, you know, one, one thing I do want to mention, I was just working with somebody who was, uh, who was going through that peak website just a couple of months ago. And it, it honestly took them three or four hours to get all the information in there. So it's not a, it's not a quick kind of thing that you do, you know, after dinner one night, it's a, it can be a project in itself. And it's important to go through and read everything. Um, and just, and again, it's not, it's not going to bust you if you put in something incorrectly. So it's in its, it, it, so just do the best that you can. And then what happens is then that goes to your county office and then the county office makes the determination. So if there's something funky with it, they'll get a hold of you and they'll contact you and work through work through any issues that are coming through um, that way. So it's a kind of a pain of a website, but but it's the one that we have. And um, and, you know, just make sure that you're breathing as you're as you're putting stuff in there. Right. So. And then another a question that just came in. Sure. I'm hearing that 
if the person meets the requisite for any waiver, they can apply for that while they're waiting for another. Does this change anything like holding process on the actual needed waiver? So it should not. Um, <clears throat> if you need to enroll, like I said earlier, in something like the elderly, blind, and disabled waiver, and you're still on the DD waiver wait list, and you're, um, oh, what's the designation? It's, it's uh, need it right away. Um, you will, you'll still be, you'll still be in that, in that queue. And so once you kind of pop up, you can make the decision. Then, do I want to move out of out of that waiver and onto the DD waiver? Um, you can also uh, refuse it at that time, but but that means you're going to go on the bottom of that wait list and go and go all the way back up. So just so everybody knows, no, that should not change um, uh, that piece. Now, what you might hear though is people being uh, brought on to the DD waiver, and you you are like, wait a minute, I've been waiting five years, and this person hasn't been around for very long. There are stipulations, and every year our State General Assembly gives us certain slots for the DD waiver for emergency issues. So um, uh, the primary caregiver is no longer able to support the individual in their current living situation. That would be an emergency kind of uh, kind of situation where they may they may get a, what we call an emergency slot. So to everybody out there, that may look like they're jumping the wait list, but they're they're actually not. They they it is a pretty significant process to claim an emergency, and there's a lot of evidence that has to go in it, and it truly is about health and safety. So it, it, the idea the kind of the the cutoff is is if this person is either going to end up in the hospital tomorrow or they're not going to have a place to live, <clears throat> and they need that kind of ongoing support. Then they then then that emergency slot is uh, is given to them, so that makes sense. One more, please. Um, you mentioned that uh, there are two adult waivers, SLS and DD. What about CDOS? Is it not a waiver? But how does it interrelate? Sure, sure. So I actually have a whole slide here oh, on right. that. So perfect timing, actually. Yeah. So CDOS or Consumer Directed Attendant Supports and Services is a service delivery option. Now, I know that sounds like government speak because it is government speak. What that actually means is that you have to be enrolled in a waiver that offers CDOS. And so what CDOS is, is it allows you to basically um, set up your services, hire and fire and set up wages for the staff that provides those services. Um, it allows that to happen, but that's all within a waiver. And so when we're talking about the two waivers for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, the one waiver that has CDOS in it currently is the SLS waiver. And so with that, you still get all of the services, but there are specific services within the SLS waiver. Um, and if you look at the slide here, if you look to the right of the screen, those are all the services that are under the SLS waiver. Not all of those services are, are also under CDOS. So this is where it gets a little complicated. CDOS really is to support people in their home. So when we're thinking about CDOS, we're not thinking about behavioral services or dental services or mentorship or any of those kinds of things. Many of those services take a higher degree to actually be able to uh, to provide. And so that does not really fit in with CDOS. So with CDOS, what you actually get is you get um, you get to work on or you get to set up and manage uh, your personal care services, your homemaker services, enhanced homemaker. And then there's a new service that's just for CDOS and it's called health maintenance. Um, and health maintenance is only available through CDOS, but what it does is it allows um, it allows us to waive some of the of the stipulations when what we call the Nurse Practice Act, so that so that more skilled services can actually be delivered through this co consumer direction. The thing about CDOS is is that it's 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 complicated. Um, if you really are a person who is very stable. Who, who doesn't mind, who kind of has the same staff every day, you kind of have the same services that you need, all of those kinds of things, CDOS might be a big headache for you. But now if you are 
a person who wants to be out more, you know, not too sure about staff, really want to have control over those kinds of things, want to make sure that you can that you can pay your staff a certain wage or any of those kinds of things, then CDOS is something that you should definitely look into. CDOS and consumer direction is, is really a very cool thing. It's a national kind of movement. And it's something that, that Medicaid in Colorado has supported for a really long time, even though CDOS and SLS has not been around for very long. And because it hasn't been around for very long, um, it's important that, that you're talking with your case manager and giving your case manager enough time to actually go and learn about, learn about this program so that they can better support you. So that's, a, that's another little piece in there. Any other questions so far? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we have Medicaid buy-in, mm -hmm. can we still apply, uh, and I'm not sure about these acronyms, CHCBS and CLOI. Or CLI. Yeah. So yeah, CHCBS is actually designed, it, it is the waiver for, uh, for children whose parents are basically over asset. Um, and so maybe a parent's, so if we, if as a Medicaid agency, we looked at, at, uh, at the parent's assets, that would put, that would put the child who needs the services over the, over the limits. And so, so the CHCBS waiver is actually designed for that. It's, it's, you might've also hear the Katie Beckett rule. And that's, that's where that waiver comes from is it's our, our updated version to the Katie Beckett rule, which basically says that that if a child has a severe disability, um, assets their assets should be taken into consideration, and the parents' assets should be kind of set to the side, if that makes sense. So that's what CHCBS is. That's a really good question about the children with life limiting illness or the CLLI waiver. I do not know if CLLI has buy-in. I believe that it does, but I can get that information and I can, I can get it back to Beth here at, at the Peak Center and so that, that they can get that information out to you. Great, thank you. Yeah. So one of the questions that really came in, um, and actually there, there are two, is really about how to choose between the two waivers, what options we have, those kinds of things. And so I wanna take some time and actually kind of discuss that. So the, S, so the DD waiver, which is the one that's up on, on the screen right now, is really designed to support people 24 hours a day. The SLS waiver is really designed to support people who are leave, either have natural supports like parents or something like that, or that they can live independently. Um, and they, they just need, they need some services throughout the day. When we say, when you look at, like I'm gonna go back, and when you look at, at the supported living services, it says limited services. Limited is very limiting language, if I can say that. As you can see, there are a lot of services in the supported living services waiver, including services that can help people live independently in their own apartment. Um, and, and with that, that what you have to think about is, does my loved one need somebody with them awake and moving around at night? Or are they pretty good about, you know, they kind of hit bedtime for me, that's like 7.30 nowadays. Do they kind of hit that time? They're really, they, they can be kind of on their own. They're, they're fine. But what they really need is they need support during the day. So they may even need support taking a shower, making sure that they, that they have good meals set up for them, getting out into the community with transportation, supportive community connections, all of those kinds of things. And we know that about 80% of individuals with, with intellectual and developmental disabilities really can, with, with substantial supports, live on their own. And so I actually take, I, I don't like that we use the language of limited supports because, because you can get pretty substantive support through that that really does allow people independence. When you're thinking about the DD waiver, not only is it 24 hours a day, it does have residential services in them. The thing with it is, is that the developmental disability waiver was designed for people with high medical needs, so medically fragile individuals, individuals who have high behavioral needs, somebody where them being on their own for more than an hour or two, really, that's just not where they're at in their life. 
And for individuals who who are who can live more independently and kind of be in the community, the developmental disability waiver can actually be somewhat limiting. Um, it can be limiting to the to their independence because of the amount of of by time services are are really utilized for that person. I hope that makes sense. So it's important to really be thinking about what your loved one, or if you are an individual in need services, what you're really looking for. And I am not by any stretch of the imagination sitting here saying, don't get on to the, onto the wait list for the DD waiver, but just to be aware of that and be aware of those two differences. That if you do come up on the DD waiver wait list and the SLS waiver is working, you may want to kind of think through, okay, did, do we need to add on all of these extra services um, because the SLS waiver is, is really working for somebody? So it's just just another thing to kind of be thinking about and be thinking through before before you make that jump. Again, I still recommend that you that you that that you and 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 your loved ones get on those wait lists as soon as you can um, for the DD waiver because it is a long wait list. So that that is an option in the future. But just be aware that that there's some extra thinking that you have to do once once your loved one comes up for for a DD waiver slot. So, Adam, as, uh, as the future gets closer for some parents, um, what, and there are issues, and I know a yep. couple of the questions that came in were related to this. Um, you want to assure that your child is going to be able to maintain the level of independence right. that he already has, he or she, or may have with SLS, but you also as a parent have to be thinking about the future when you may not be able to be engaged in that or provide and assure that those natural supports are happening. Absolutely, and, and that is a huge thing. And so with that, um, one of the things in the DD waiver is there's not just one or two different residential support models. There are quite a few, um, and that's what this slide talks about here. There are, um, if, you, if you or your loved one um, can live independently, um, and I, I would even recommend, even if you can't live independently, to as soon as you can, as soon as you turn 18, work to get onto housing, housing voucher waiting lists. Um, there's a housing authority all over, all over the state of Colorado when you guys download this this uh, this slide deck, there's actually a link at the bottom of this slide that will take you to the Department of Housing, so you can, you can get more information. Vouchers, housing voucher doesn't mean that somebody has to go and live into what quote unquote we would call low income housing. You can get a you can get a housing voucher that allows you to go and support your individual in finding an apartment in the community somewhere in the community. That voucher will stay with that person as long as they don't have a, as long as they don't catch a felony somewhere along the line or something else. And there's even ways to work around that. That will that will support somebody in paying their rent for the rest of their lives if that's what they need it for. What that also allows to happen is that you can actually then hire staff or you can work with a provider agency to bring staff into the individual's home. That you can also set it up, and we see these models around Colorado. We actually see them quite a bit around the country. Missouri is really good at this, of actually having having staff live in the home. And so, if you need that level of support, you can actually get a voucher for a two bedroom apartment, even if only one, even if it's only for one individual, so that they can actually have staff come and live with them. What that does is is if that staff doesn't want to do it anymore, or if the individual in services has a problem with the staff and they want to get rid of that staff, they can get rid of them and they don't have to move. So that's one of the one of the benefits to to utilizing that that model, and that's the individual residence model that's on here. There's another one that family caregiver and family caregiver model can really support somebody while they're on the, those voucher waiting lists. Um, you know, while mom and dad are still are, are still kind of uh, able to to really care for the individual, you can also 
kind of use some of that to help them transition into their own apartments because you still maintain, you can still be the staff and go in and support them and get them used to living in their own apartment and kind of setting things up. You can do all of those things. So that's, that's what family caregiver is. The thing with family caregiver that I think is really important to know before you go into it, from a system standpoint, we see a family caregiver just like any other staff. So you still have to go and get all of the same uh, uh, trainings. You still have to comply with all of the regulations around fire safety. Um, you have to still fill out all the same paperwork and keep all the log notes and do all of those kinds of things. All family caregiver does is it just allows Medicaid to pay a family member to provide the care. But at the end of the day, Medicaid still sees that family member as staff and you are you still have to follow all the same regulations. I think that's something that's really important to know before you start walking down that road that there's still you're still going to be considered staff and you're still going to have to comply with all the regulations that uh, that you would find in a host home or a group home. So that's the other two kind of models I want to touch on. Host home is uh, one to three individuals living in a residence um, and they live with a host home provider. So you live with a host home provider in their home. Um, with those models, you run into that issue. If something does not work in that model, the individual who is in services is the one who has to move uh, because the host home provider owns the house. So you can't really have them move out. Um, now with group homes, group homes can actually be uh, uh, pretty good um, in the sense that that if you are somebody who kind of runs through staff quickly, um, but you need somebody, you need kind of stable kind of program kind of every day, group homes, group homes can be one of those models that really allow that to happen because you can rope because providers can rotate staff through there. Everybody's trained on, on who everybody that's living there. Um, as our system is changing and moving towards more community integration, more independence, those kinds of things, even in a group home, you still have the right to say who you want to live with and who you don't. You still have a right to, uh, you still get a lease or a, or a rental agreement. Um, you have the right to decorate your room however you want to decorate your room. You still have all of those freedoms. And really, group homes can be one of those, one of those places where, uh, where they can, they can also be a short-term type of thing. So as somebody's waiting for a voucher or something like that, you can go into a group home or even a host home and you can change any of this anytime you want to change it. This is not something that when you turn 18 or you get the DD waiver and you make a decision, okay, we're going to go with the host home, that you are going to have to stay in that model for the rest of the person's life. You can change it when a voucher pops up or you know, uh, somebody buys somebody a house or something like that. You can change between these models as as you need to, as you kind of learn more, maybe you maybe you have somebody down the street that's a great host home provider, and you want to switch to them. You can work with the case manager to make all of that kind of stuff happen. It's really important to remember that all of the services that we are talking about can be changed and melded to meet the individual's needs. Um, and so, and not saying that it's going to happen overnight. But as long as you know what you're asking for and you continue to advocate for that, the system the system will catch up to it, if that makes sense. Um, there's a couple other questions Please. now, Adam. But before I go into those, I just want to mention that um, we had heard from several of you that you were having trouble uh, downloading the document that's on the handouts. Um, we have been told by our tech person that you may need to try a different browser to access that. And I did hear back from someone who said, thank you, I did try another browser and it worked. So just wanted to mention that. Um, question, does the SIS, S-I-S score, which I hope you can explain the acronym, apply to the DD waiver? Yeah, so the SIS or the support intensity scale is what we call it, or that's what it's called. I, we, we follow whatever they tell us to do it. Um, it's a nationally normed uh, assessment, um, and it is used for both the SLS and the DD waiver. Um, it's one of those things that you need a combination of what we call the SIS and the 100.2. 
those two things set up your level of care or the amount or in the DD waiver, basically how much a provider is going to be reimbursed for the services that the individual needs, the supports and services. In the SLS waiver, it actually sets up the amount your budget will be for that year. The SIS, you only you legitimately only have to do it once. Um, you can request that 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 you get another SIS uh, whenever you want. If you feel like the SIS is is came out incorrectly, you can appeal it. If you feel like something has changed, you know, three years down the line, you can you can re request to do another SIS. Warning that the SIS is uh, takes you know four hours or so. I mean, it's it's a long kind of thing and. It's one of those that you can even work with your case manager to make sure that if the person that you're, that you're supporting doesn't want to necessarily listen to all the nitty gritty things that are in the SIS, you can do that. You, you can set that up so that they don't have to be there for all of it. Also, it's really important, just like when you're going and applying for Social Security. I used to work with people um, with persistent mental health disorders in trying to set them up with Social Security. And this is the same thing that I told them that I that I want to tell you guys with the CIS. With the CIS, pretend you're reporting on the worst day. You're not reporting on the best day. And the CIS person, the person who is, is performing the CIS or asking the questions, they are highly trained um, and they have no judgment. They just want the information. So I know that it can be embarrassing for some people. I know that it can be um, it can be kind of gut wrenching and and totally understand that it's really important that you're reporting you're reporting from um, maybe the second worst day um, so that we make sure that we're capturing what we need out of the sys because that's really going to set things up in the waiver so that's just really important to, to know about um, you know even if it is the best day ever for the individual you're supporting be thinking about the those other days that it's not the best day because that's 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 what the sis is trying to capture because we want to know the level of support the individual is going to need going forward the 100.2 you're going to see that every single year so that captures any changes in medical conditions it does all of those kinds of things so that's that's the piece you're going to see every single year now in 2022 just to warn you guys we are moving to a completely different assessment and we're building the assessment. It's actually going through a pilot stage right now. So there might even be some folks on the phone who actually utilize that assessment along with the SIS. The goal is to actually move away from the SIS um, and utilize that other assessment. That other assessment is much, much more global. Um, it actually talks about even things like volunteerism, employment, all of those kinds of pieces are kind of matched in there, and we're, we're hoping that it that it's going to work a lot better. So just so everybody knows that that's coming down the road. Is there a name you're using for that assessment uh, now? No, um, I think you, I think you might hear it connected to things like called Ariel. That's going to be the new case management system, uh, things like that. So just kind of warning, you might run into it currently, um, or but you're going to see it. You're going to see it in the future. And you're willing to come back. And help us I'm, willing, again, right? I'm willing to send the person who knows about it to come back and, <laughs> and do that. So there, there is one question that we got prior. Well, there's, there's two that I just want to touch on really quick. Could I? Yeah, yeah. Go back. There was another question yeah. related to the DD waiver. Sure. If the DD waiver becomes available for an individual, how long does the person have to put it into effect? I'm thinking of the family caregiver option. Seems like it would take a while to set that up. I recently went through getting set up for CDOS and that took six months. All of this stuff takes time. So just like with the SLS waiver to, to get fully, probably if you're moving from the, from another waiver into the DD waiver, it won't take quite as long because you already have providers identified. Um, you already have uh, some most of the information that everybody needs. So, so it may not take as long, but you're still looking at six to nine months to, to really go through this entire process. Um, and, and even though that, that is a long time, um, it's, it's not that it's going slowly, if that makes sense, it's that there's a lot of pieces that you gotta, you gotta all cram together 
to to make the waiver kind of uh, actually work for somebody. So that just it takes it takes some time. But again, um, you know, you can be enrolled in a different waiver while you're enrolling in the developmental disability waiver. Um, you can utilize state SLS if the CCB has that available. You can there's there's some tricks that you can that you can do in there that can that can help kind of bridge that gap. Great. Couple more. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. Um, could you say again what CIS stands sure. for and means? Um, okay. Yeah. So the CIS mean. stands for the Support Intensity Scale. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then related to the new assessment, will everyone have to go through that new assessment at that time, and will it be tied to the amount of money? So, so yeah, it, it will be tied to. Um, it, it's basically going to work just like it does now. It's just a different assessment. So if you're on the SLS waiver, yeah, it will set up your SPAL. It will set up kind of your overall budget. Um, from my understanding, and do not quote me on this, but I can find out to either confirm or that I'm completely wrong. Um, it's If you already have a system in place, I don't believe they're going to make you go back through that if you don't want to. Um, but I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it may not be a bad idea. Um, it's, you know, it really is about, uh, because it's so much more global in the questions that they ask that it really, it's, it really is set up on that person centered planning philosophy. So it's, it's not just about what the medical need is or the behavioral need or the ADL need. It's, it's also what, what is this person interested in? And the new assessment can really be utilized to kind of really help design and set up the support plan. A little bit more, uh, a little bit more in a person-centered way. Okay, my son. This is one of the questions. Yeah. My son wants to get married someday. Mm -hmm. It's true. My son too. Is it harder for married couples to find supported living arrangements? No, actually, it's not. Um, if you if you kind of go through the through the housing voucher piece, you can actually get a voucher. You can get a three-bedroom apartment under that. Uh, for a married couple, those those do support married couples. You can even add, let's say, let's say uh, your son has the voucher, and and they get married. Um, you can actually add the wife to that voucher. Uh, one thing that I would recommend um, is when somebody's kind of kind of going down the road to towards marriage, it's probably not a bad idea to to reach out to a benefit specialist of some kind. Um, and you can either, and I, I can get you guys some information about that, but really sitting down with a benefit specialist, and these are folks who really understand how, what benefits and how they work and how they all kind of fit together, including social security. What, why I'm recommending that is because when you, when you combine two incomes, it does change some stuff around and they, they can at least give you information about how that's going to affect, uh, the individual. Um, and or or the couple themselves and what some of those changes are actually going to need or mean. Um, and so I would just I would just recommend that. And I've worked with clients uh, who are getting married and they, they went through that and uh, it, it was really, really beneficial. They still got married. They're still great. They're still uh, living a happy life. But they walked into it with their eyes with their eyes open to, yeah, you know, our our combined income is going to be greater, but our individual is going to come down a little bit. Uh, things like that. Thanks. Sure. So uh, a couple of the questions that we came in. So the one eligibility for, for immigrants to Medicaid, I am still trying to find that information. It is something that is continuously changing in our current, in our current climate. Um, and so there's some, uh, I don't want to give out the wrong information. So I'm still trying to gather that and I will get that stuff to you. Um, the other one that I really wanted to touch base on is something that's more near and dear um, to, to, to my passions, even though actually um, people getting on Medicaid who are immigrants is actually a really big passion of mine, um, but I don't know much about it. So moving on to the, to, uh, the question was, what can we do about the resurgence of day programming in quasi-inclusive settings provided as the only viable option for many youth currently um, exiting the school system? So there's a couple of things with that. The biggest one is, is that Medicaid is, is just uh, started or is implementing now the home and community-based final settings rule. What the final settings rule basically is, is if you guys 
if you think back in history, we used to, you know, have everybody with an intellectual developmental disability, they were living in an institution. At the time that the institution started, that was a really good model. Um, and as time moved on, we realized that, that that for the time and the place, it was okay, but now we need to move into more community-based supports and services. So what happened is there was a big push to close down institutions, which is a great thing, and move people into the community. The thing that we forgot to do was to take the institution out of the community-based supports and services. So you're still going to, there's still a lot of remnants of kind of institutional care within the community. What the settings rule is really designed to do is to kind of break that last institutional style of care down and really allow, um, really allow for independence, integration into the community, um, all of those kinds of pieces. And so as, so as it kind of was, before, you know, prior to the settings rule where an individual might be in a special ed class, they kind of graduate and then they move into kind of more segregated settings. A lot of that we're moving away from. It's going to be a long time. It's, it's a paradigm shift. So we have to have the settings rule in place by 2022, but that's kind of the start point, right? We still need to do a lot more work to make sure community integration is just what's happening and, and is the norm. Um, and one of the best ways to do that is through employment. Employment, uh, Colorado is an employment first state. Um, and what employment first means is that everybody, no matter the significance of the disability, has the ability to work in the community and in community integrated employment or competitively integrated employment. And so there's some supports and services that are in both the DD and SLS waiver that can support somebody in, in actually finding, getting a job, thinking about a career and where they wanna be in five years and actually work towards those pieces, um, all, of, all of that kind of stuff. So the, the services that I'm talking about are both job development and placement, and then job coaching. Job development is a service that is specifically set aside to support somebody in identifying the skills that they have and in exploring employment services, so, or just in exploring employment in general. And so you can utilize that through the waiver. Then there's also job coaching. And job coaching is when a provider sends somebody to support an individual in completing and learning their job tasks so that they can be successful in their job. So there's a lot of different kind of, kinds of ins and outs with, with these pieces, but one of the things that I would highly recommend is that, especially if you have an individual who is kind of, you know, freshman, junior, freshman between freshman and junior in high school, those kind of pieces to really start working with um, and telling your special ed teachers and, and the support staff in the schools that work is really in the future for my loved one and that we should start thinking about that now so that when we transition into the adult world, there's still there, there's some already some understanding of what kind of jobs the person may want, kind of where they want to go with things, all of that kind of stuff. The trick with job coaching or trick with all of these services is that you also have to utilize DVR in that, or Division for, Vo for Vocational Rehabilitation. DVR is a really good program. It will support anybody <coughs> in getting a job. Now, I know that there's a lot of people out there who have probably heard, well, I go to DVR and they say that my son or daughter is not employable. Um, I go to DVR and there's a long wait list. I go to DVR and do all of that. All of that, they are also going through a similar paradigm shift that we are going through in the Medicaid world. It is no longer um, their belief that there are certain people who are not employable. They all believe that everyone is employable and they're gonna support an individual in being able to do that. What's really cool is in the next couple of years, we're gonna have brand new models for supported employment in Colorado that are actually designed to support people with the most significant disabilities in finding work. Um, and What's also nice now too is, is that DVR has their own eligibility, right? So you go and you say, I wanna work with you DVR. DVR goes, great, I have to go collect all of this information, make sure the person's eligible. We have to do another service plan type of thing. They call it an individual plan for employment before we can work with you. 
In the meantime, while that's happening, the waiver can support that individual in engaging really quickly in employment activities. So while you're waiting to get onto DVR, you can utilize waiver services themselves to support that person in starting that process, including even job coaching. So, you know, in Denver, a big, a big place that everybody wants to work at is Coors Field or Pepsi Center or something like that. Well, pretty, they, they basically do mass hires for those. And so what we find is a lot of people sign up for DVR and while they're waiting for eligibility to happen, they get a job at the Pepsi Center. With this, that means that they can start that job and use a job coach. And when DVR clicks on, it's up to the provider to figure out who, who needs to be billing for what. So just so that you guys know, this is the probably the most significant the most significant way to ensure that your loved one is not going into more segregated settings. This is the easiest, well, easiest I say that, but I know it's not that easy. But this is the most surefire way of making sure that uh, that your loved one is is not going to move into a specialized tab or is not going to to kind of be in segregated settings. Um, supported employment can be used in combination with other things. So it doesn't mean that you use supported employment and you can't go and do community outings. That's not what that means. You can utilize all of it. You can also utilize job coaching and job development at the same time to make sure that you're talking about kind of future tense, um, all of those kinds of things. And I do have to say that in my in my career, uh, we had a I had an individual who had um, who had Down syndrome, and he I was working with him and his parents, and I still remember this meeting. We we're sitting in his house in his dining room, and I asked him what he wanted to be when he graduated, and he said he said I want to be Spider Man. And the next question that came out after after some people in the room kind of chuckled and were kind of like, you can't be Spider-Man. There were some intelligent people in the room who said, OK, what do you mean by that? And what he meant by that was that he liked to wear costumes. This is also rural New Mexico, you know, before before cosplay was like a big thing um, that he wanted to learn how to climb rocks. Again, he's in Farmington, New Mexico. There's a lot of rocks to climb. And he wanted a job where he could help people. And so what we did is we actually built his service plan around those, those principles. And one of the first things we did was to utilize supported employment in, the, in that waiver down there to help him find a job at the local hospital. And over time, he started off as a candy striper and then moved in and he was in attendance um, until, until the point that he told somebody that he loved Spider-Man and one of his favorite things was to dress up. And so they actually worked with him to have him come in dressed up as Spider-Man into the cancer children's ward of the hospital. And the last that I heard was, was about, oh, about three years ago is that he was still doing that and still loving it. So it's also not just about that it has to be a job that you go and you help somebody find at McDonald's or at King Supers or at Walgreens. Um, all of those are great jobs, but it can also mean that through job development, that you're working with the individual to really find out what they're passionate about and supporting them in finding the kind of the kind of role in the community that is meaningful for them. Because we know that that's not only um, important when it comes to cost, it brings down cost, but it's also just an inalienable right. People have the right to be independent. People have the right to choose the way they want to live their life. And just because you have a disability does not mean that you that you don't have those same rights. So it's about utilizing the services to ensure that that person has that right. Um, so that's I I saw the I saw the the sliver of being able to get employment in into this. So I, I took it. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, very much. Um, there's a couple other things, and we're very very close to one o'clock. Yes. Um, uh, there's a couple of logistical things related to the handout. Sure. Also, a resource that was shared about a benefits counseling guide um, that's available through APSI. Um, I will make sure we do a follow up email to everyone to make sure we share that. Um, uh, one more quick question about job coaching. I just wanted to mention yeah. customized employment. We actually have a webinar on the peak website that our project did with michael callahan oh nice who's a national 
spokesperson expert on that, and you're welcome to view that. In my personal experience, job coaching has been very helpful, but is one of the most expensive services that comes out of my child's plan. About $60 an hour comes out of her plan for her to work at a minimum wage job, so it doesn't seem to make much sense. It is. It is. It's uh, $58 an hour. I know that off the top of my head. It's the only number. I don't even know my phone number, but I know how much that service costs. Um, so there's a couple of things within that. Um, it, it is it, the reason why it's paid so much or why that reimbursement is so high is that the job coach should be a very highly skilled person. And the goal should be that the job coach is fading out so that the person is gaining more and more independence. We're doing work right now to really try to make the system understand that a little bit better um, so that fading out becomes more of the norm and less of the, less of the exception to the rule. Right now, you're gonna see that job coaching pretty much stays in place um, all the way through the person's career. Um, that's really not traditionally how job coaching is supposed to be utilized. And you guys can advocate in your IDT to make sure that that's, that that's understood. And, and that's one way to kind of work around some of those prices. I'm also going to sit here and say from, from a HICPA perspective, we understand that, that, that this is a major barrier. Um, and, and, can, and we hope to, through a couple of different mechanisms, to try to help fix that. Um, one of those mechanisms is, is that We've just employed new uh, provider um, um, qualifications. So providers will have to be trained at a, for, to be able to do this service differently. That will help with that, with that fading out kind of piece. We're also looking at, at employing different models. Um, and we're actually going to start this year a pilot within HICPUF that actually uh, incentivizes providers to do that fading out to make sure that the job a match is is actually a good match instead of, you know, if somebody, if I had a job coach and somebody took me to Target, I don't want to work at Target. Like I want to go to Target and I want to go look at the TVs and the video games and, and I really like toys. So I like to go and look at toys and all of that kind of stuff. I don't want to work at Target. Um, and what job development can do is make sure that the person is getting into a job that they care about and that they're interested in you will be amazed at how quickly the need for job coaching goes away when somebody's actually engaged in the work that they're doing. So again, we know that's a major barrier. We're trying to do some work around it and there isn't an easy fix, but we're, we're hoping some of that will, will be helpful. Thank you, Adam. And yes. you had resources I did. at the end. So we can share those Please. with folks. Um, with regards to the handout, I did hear back from some folks who tried the new uh, new um, browser, and that worked. Um, if you still have trouble with that, let me know. Um, I'm going to leave the webinar open for a while. So for those of you who haven't been able to download yet, for you to work on that. Um, and Adam, thank you so much. Oh, thank so you, guys. Much. Yes, absolutely. We really appreciate your time. Yeah. And what you've shared with us today. It, so, And just so everybody knows, too, my email is on here. That's the best way to get a hold of me. Um, I absolutely do not mind if you guys send me questions. It makes me more knowledgeable about stuff anyway. Um, so please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, if I'm not the right person, I can also get you in, the, in contact with the right people. Great. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank and thanks you. to everyone for your participation.